as well. First, Monsignor Rodano will lead us in a opening prayer. Okay. There are many places in scripture which speak about unity of Christians. One that is perhaps an ecumenical classic in regard to the unity of Christians is the prayer of Jesus for the unity of his disciples. John 17, 20 to 21. So I'd like to read that. I ask not only on behalf of these, but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through your word, that they may all be one. As you, Father, are in me, and I am in you, may they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given them, so that they may be one, as we are one, I in them, and you in me, that they may become completely one, so that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. So this beautiful prayer of Jesus for the unity of his disciples. Let us pray. Lord, bless each participant in this program today. As we proceed in this conversation, help us to proceed in your spirit you who call us to unity as your disciples. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Monsignor. Welcome, everyone, to Catholics and Latter-day Saints, a dialogue. Just a little bit of information about me and this event before we get going. I'm a communication and English major here at Seton Hall, and this is a part of my senior thesis. I converted to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints about a year and a half ago, and since then it's been a huge part of my life. And when I joined, I saw a lot of similarities between LDS and Catholics, and I really thought they were a lot more similar than a lot of people would think. Um, so that's kind of what inspired me to do this project. So this is a small step in a larger Catholic and Latter-day Saint dialogue that has been happening around us. Um, notably, in 2019, with the opening of the Rome Temple, President Nelson visited Pope Francis, and they had a meeting and exchanged words and gifts. So this is a small step in the steps they've already set for us. So first, I'm going to introduce our six panelists. And then we will get into the questions, many of which were submitted by the audience members prior. So our guests are, we have Hannah Syriac. Syriac. Hannah is a current MA candidate in the Comparative Studies program at BYU, uh, emphasizing the intersection of Greco-Roman literature with early Christian <coughs> literature. Hannah is also, also has worked with the Neil A. Maxwell Institute as a research assistant looking at 19th century Mormonism as well as Mormon fundamentalism and folklore. We also have Professor Matthew Smaltz. Uh, Professor Smaltz is a history, uh, teacher, of, an historian of religion teaching at the College of Holy Cross in Massachusetts. He is a Catholic scholar deeply committed to dialogue with the Latter-day Saint community and has completed a book co-authored by BYU professor Alonzo Gasquil entitled Understanding Our Catholic Neighbors, A Guide for Latter-day Saints. As well, we have Monsignor Rodano, who is currently an adjunct professor of systematic theology here at Seton Hall. Uh, Monsignor Rodano has been a longtime participant in Catholic ecumenical and interreligious efforts, including participating in two international assemblies for the World Conference on Religion and Peace, and served on the Pontifical Council for Promoting Christian Unity for 24 years. Professor Mauro Properzi is an associate professor at BYU who currently teaches classes on world religions and Christian theology. He recently returned from a one-year experience teaching Bible courses at the BYU Jerusalem Center. He is the chair of the BYU Religious Outreach Council, a campus-wide <coughs> organization that facilitates interfaith dialogue. We also have Father Dan Dwyer, Father Dan is a current associate professor of history at Siena College. 
Father Dan is a longtime member of Mormon History Association and is currently working on a book detailing his involvement with Mormon history. He has written several essays that appeared in the Journal of Mormon History, Dialogue, A Journal of Mormon Thought, and the Provincial Annals. And finally, but of course not least, we have Brother Corey Shivers. Corey Shivers is a partner in international law firm based in New York City. He recently completed a nine-year term and is calling as first counselor and the presidency responsible for nine congregations that constitute the Scotch Plains stake of New Jersey. During that time, he served on the summit New Jersey Interfaith Council, most recently serving as secretary. Um, he lives with his wife in South Orange. They are the parents of three sons and have three grandchildren. Awesome. So we're just going to jump straight into our questions and try to make this really a conversation um, around these questions. So I kind of already answered this question a little bit for myself, but we're going to open with what drove your interest in the communication between the two faiths? Um, so those of you who have already kind of participated in some dialogue between Catholics and Latter-day Saints, I'd encourage you to take this question first. I'd be willing to start if that's okay. Of course. I um, became interested because I think I was a nerdy child and I would go to the library and I was always interested in books on history and religion. And I saw this maroon colored book, this is a long time ago, it said on the Book of Mormon. And I said, what's this? And so I took it out and I read it. And then I, you know, I, but that's what I tended to do. I read the Bhagavad Gita and the Quran and the Bible and everything else. But as time went on, um, I became interested partly because a friend of mine who became a Latter-day Saint and would take me to the Hill Camorra pageant in Palmyra, New York. And um, so we got interested in that. And um, I began to read up on, on, uh, Latter-day Saints, and I was kind of uh, fascinated by certain things. There was writing that says about the Lamanites, and I always had this idea that even though I was Irish American, I thought I was an American Indian for some reason. <laughs> so I was interested in that. I did find out I was one percent according to my DNA. Um, I was also interested in tracing my family tree, and I actually found out I'm a distant cousin of Emma Smith. So um, as time went on, I just got fascinated by the church's history. Uh, I had never really been interested in American history, and the, I, I was always interested in religious history, and I was intrigued by this, so that eventually I started going to the Mormon History Association conferences, and uh, I now have a group of friends, we call ourselves the Morlicks, we're Mormons and Catholics, we also have other people, but it was too long of an acronym, so we gathered together sometimes virtually, sometimes in person, and have become really good friends over the years, so that's my story. Thank you. Could I, could I continue? Could I say something? Yeah, of course. Um, I, I worked for 24 years in Rome at the Secretariat and Pontifical Council for Promoting Christian Unity. And uh, in that work, we dealt with Every every Christian group, Orthodox, Protestants, Anglicans, Evangelicals, Pentecostals, but we didn't deal with the Latter-day Saints. We had international dialogues with uh, all of those groups that have produced many, many reports. They're published in a, a series of volumes. And we worked with the World Council of Churches. Catholic Church is not a member of the World Council, but it is a partner. We have a joint working group since 1965, <coughs> since 1965 between the Catholic Church and the World Council of Churches. The World Council itself is huge. It's some uh, 350 churches from all, all, all around the world perhaps some 500, uh, 500 million uh, members. Um, and so we had all this experience with all these groups, but there was nothing in regard to, with the uh, Latter-day Saints. And so one of the reasons that I am happy to be part of this group is so that I can learn something. I've never had opportunities in dialogue. In all, in all our dialogues, you learn something about the partner and vice versa. 
And so I hope to learn something about the Latter-day Saints in this conversation. Thank you. I'd be happy to go next. Okay, awesome. So um, I grew up Catholic and most of my family is still Catholic. Um, my family was the type of, of Catholics that, you know, go back generation and generation. I don't think I know a single, you know, line in my family that isn't Catholic. And I've done my family history since joining the church. Um, so my personal interest really started when I decided that I was going to convert um, to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. But I still had a very deep love and affection for the liturgy of the Catholic Church, for what I saw as the reality of Christ that's present in the sacraments. And that was something that really has still stuck with me. Um, and then coming to uh, BYU, I actually got a chance to work with Brother Preparity here. Um, and I saw that there were some Latter-day Saints who were doing Latter-day Saint and Catholic work. And I decided that I wanted to be a part of those interfaith efforts and to kind of pay homage to the uh, faith of my childhood and the faith of my family while still respecting and honoring my own faith. I'm happy to go next, if that's okay. Um, I, I would say that for me, my interest has kind of uh, gone through different stages. It, it builds up um, through, throughout my experiences. Primarily, I grew up uh, as a Latter-day Saint in, in Italy. So um, I was four years old when, uh, when my parents uh, joined the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Um, so I didn't really have uh, much of an interaction uh, with uh, Catholicism, even though I was in, in Italy. Um, and, uh, and so I, I think there's some element <laughs> of uh, you know coming to the United States and uh, pursuing my uh, academic uh, <clears throat> education here, experiencing um, maybe some cultural uh, distance with my home country. And uh, in some ways, an interest in Catholicism was a way to kind of stay connected with Italy. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so that's kind of the, the, the first level, I would say. Uh, then also um, a major uh, impact on it was my graduate studies experience in England. I spent about five years in the UK, uh, both at Cambridge and Durham, studying religious studies and theology, um, where I met several fellow students who were um, either Protestants or Catholic or, or Jewish or members of different faiths. Uh, and for... The first time I experienced the kind of connection with uh, fellow um, people of faith that I, I hadn't um, either looked for or really had experienced during my uh, adolescence and earlier in my life. Um, and partly as a result of that, I decided to have a full immersion uh, dialogue experience. And so following my PhD, I spent a year at the uh, Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome, um, where I pursued um, uh, a diploma in um, interreligious uh, studies. And uh, it's an institute that is now not existent uh, anymore. Uh, it's been absorbed into the faculty of uh, missiology since then. Um, but, you know, these are kind of the, the, the milestones, I would say, that have pushed me in this direction. Awesome. Um, does anyone else want to speak on this question? If not, I'll move on to another one. I suppose I should probably uh, share a little bit of my experience. Um, in some ways, I was first drawn to the LDS tradition by a close family friend, uh, Mario De Pillis, who's a well-known historian of uh, <laughs> the LDS tradition. And it was, you know, in many ways, um, it piqued my curiosity in a way that uh, is similar to what Father Dan is talking about, I think. Um, but then as I uh, not only studied the LDS tradition, um, but also came to have um, Mormon friends who are very, very important to me, um, it became much more than simply 
understanding or trying to understand a religious tradition that was different from my own, but um, a religious tradition that in some ways had some very interesting similarities or at least similar concerns um, as my Catholic uh, tradition does. But also, you know, recognizing that um, Latter-day Saints are brothers and sisters of Catholics in Christ, then trying to make sense of that um, unity and diversity um, that uh, characterizes Christianity as a whole. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you all. Um, so this next question, I'm going to direct at Hannah first, because she is the only one here who has lived as both a Catholic and a Latter-day Saint. Um, so Hannah, this question is, how do you think Catholics and Latter-day Saints can facilitate a positive dialogue just in their everyday lives? Thanks for the question. I, I think the most important thing is trying to understand each other and not making caricatures of the various beliefs. I can speak um, coming from a Latter-day Saint perspective where I feel like Latter-day Saints, since we have such a different conception of the Godhead, it can be very <clears throat> difficult for us to understand what Catholics believe the Trinity is. And in so doing, I, I feel as though we can sometimes make caricatures of these beliefs and that can put a blockage in our dialogue because we assume that the other doesn't have any desire to understand. Um, and speaking as my from my experience as a Catholic, um, when I discovered Latter-day Saint religion, I realized that so many of my misconceptions about that religion were causing me to have some type of prejudice towards Latter-day Saints. Uh, of course, that's not true for everyone, but that was my experience where um, I had heard things about polygamy, for example, and assumed that Latter-day Saints still practice that. Um, because that was what was taught to me. Um, so I think the most important thing when approaching a dialogue is just trying to understand what someone actually believes and not necessarily placing a value judgment on that belief um, and being very open-minded about the beauty that you can find in each other's beliefs. Because I know that I, even though I converted to the church, I still have such a deep love of Catholicism because I find the doctrine and the sacraments to be just so uplifting and so beautiful and so Christ-centered. Thank you. That was really well put. I, I, I'm happy to give an example. When you talk about everyday life, um, I, I, I spent about 10 years in London practicing there. And as a young uh, lawyer there, one of my, my colleagues um, was a, an Italian lawyer who was about to get married, Catholic. He was marrying someone who's his fiance, his, uh, his fiance's father uh, worked at the Vatican. And when she come and visit, uh, she was chaperoned. And you might imagine the, the fun that he was made, you know, a lot of our colleagues would make fun of him. It was a source of humor, right? That he was in the situation about to marry someone and, and being chaperoned and, and so forth. But I, he, he and I uh, uh, appreciated uh, and had the opportunity to talk about that. And I know that in, in both of us living our, our, our faith, he, he knew he could look at me as someone that uh, understood exactly what he was doing and understood and believed and practiced, you know, uh, abstinence before marriage and, and, and just the ability to, um, to relate to each other and, and for, for in, in an everyday point of view in terms of living your religion, and, and living what you believe and supporting each other, uh, I think there's great value in, in that. Thank you. Ellen, if, if I could uh, echo, uh, first of all, uh, what was just said and, uh, and just uh, briefly add, um, and I don't mean to embarrass him here, but uh, I wanna talk about Matt for a second, but uh, uh, in terms of uh, how the, the dialogue um, the larger dialogue, the LDS Catholic dialogue, um, I feel has been manifested in our own specific uh, friendship um, as, um, as an example of something that goes beyond uh, an academic pursuit. Um, I find that uh, as I've come to know Matt and as he's come to know me, we have developed the kind of uh, relationship where you know, we can talk about our children, about uh, how our families are doing, and uh, 
or challenges. I mean, we, we know each other as friends and, and that creates a level of trust um, and, and a level of understanding that um, really opens the doors to uh, all kinds of diff different and difficult conversations, possibly that are more theological in nature. So I would say that's an important uh, thing to be able to do uh, in the day-to-day -day life, just build uh, relationships of, of friendship and brotherhood and sisterhood with your neighbors. Um, and then from there, you can move on to so many other different things. Thank you. Ellen, uh, may I say something about the phrase in two speaks of the one true church. Mm -hmm. Each, each, each uh, sees itself as the one true church. Um, in the Vatican document on ecumenism, it says this. It is through Christ's Catholic Church alone, which is the all embracing means of salvation, that the fullness of the means of salvation can be obtained. So it says that, but in the same number, it also speaks about the Christian values of, of all the other Christians. Mm -hmm. For example, it, um, it, it speaks of that other, other Christians can be used by God for salvation. It speaks of the Orthodox churches as churches. It, it, they are churches, and so that means if they're churches, they're true churches. And um, it, it speaks about how the Western Roman tradition learned a great deal from the Eastern tradition in the early centuries, how much we depended on them for our understanding of liturgy, jurisprudence, and a number of other things. And so when we speak of one true church, that has to be, that, that has to be carefully understood. Uh, when we say that, we don't mean that others have no value. And we, we don't, you know, as I said, we, we speak of the Orthodox and others as churches. And so uh, it's the, the question is, it, it looks, as it's presented here, it looks too, too much like this each one simply speaks of uh, they are one Christ, one true church. And I think that that's, at least for, from our point of view, that has to be qualified in a certain way, that we believe that we the Catholic Church has the means of all the means of salvation, but that doesn't mean that others don't share in that as well. And I think that's a very important um, nuance that has to be made. And it is through dialogue, the ecumenical dialogues that we have, that we've learned how much we have in common. The Vatican document on ecumenism <clears throat> spe speaks of, of um, uh, levels of communion that we share, levels of Christianity that we share. And as the dialogues continue, uh, they show more and more how much we share with others. And so that's what needs to continue to develop. If I, if I could add to that, uh, a number of years ago, I was in Utah and I went out to dinner with a friend of mine who's Latter-day Saint. And he said, you know, I'm team teaching a class at Utah Valley University. Uh, and I think they had a thing called the Mormon Studies Department or something. There were three of them teaching. He said, you want to go sit in on the class and see what it's like? I said, sure. Well, I was wearing secular clothes. And so I just thought I'd sit in the back. And the night I went in, there on the board is the Vatican statement about uh, baptism of Latter-day Saints. And, um, and the other professor who was teaching that night knew who I was. And he said, and we have a Catholic priest here to explain this to us. So that was not really what I wanted to do. But um, I got talking to people and I said, well, it's not, I said, then I thought they thought this was important. I said, our saying that we don't recognize your baptism doesn't mean we think you're bad people. I said, it's just, we're saying, we mean different things by the words. I said, and by the way, I said, you don't recognize ours either, do you? And they said, oh, that's right, we don't. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> I think part of the, um, <clears throat> sometimes the words get in the way 
Um, and the reality of human relationships um, sometimes transcend um, definition. I think theology is very important. I think these the conversations that go on about things like patristics or the Trinity or um, apostasy are important conversations. But I think on a day-to-day -day lived uh, level, you have people in both churches that sometimes seem more similar to, to your own church than to some of your fellow members in, in the one you're in. Uh, and, um, and then uh, I, like, I was thinking with Hannah, I have a friend who, I have two friends. One was a Latter-day Saint who became a Catholic. One was a Catholic who became a Latter-day Saint. And the Catholic who became a Latter-day Saint confessed to me recently. He said, uh, my wife doesn't understand this, but I still pray to St. Anthony when I lose something. <laughs> so there's a human side to it, I think, that um, uh, sometimes we have to make sure that our, our um, disagreement about or our different view of um, theological concepts doesn't get in the way of that human relationship. Thank you. Does anyone else want to add on to that or follow up? I, I I agree uh, completely with that statement. I and I think there are so many beautiful things. I, I when you talk about, I know one of your questions was talking about the sacraments, but when you talk about, you know, with the, with the sacrament of marriage, I, I think there's an expression that I've seen used referring to marriage in the domestic church, um, which I, I think is very in keeping today in this day and age as a practical matter with the, the same types of issues that that we've come to realize as a church and, and the focus that we've made on a, a home-centered and church-supported gospel where the recognition is is for the faith to be transmitted from generation to generation we can't just depend on on, on, on the church out there so to speak but it really needs to be brought home and the teachings uh, made with parents and their children in, in, the, in the home and and to see that you know, I, I think sharing how people do that, for instance, is is something that's a, a practical thing to, to understand. I know that we've appreciated during this this pandemic to have the ability because of, of this focus and, and program that's been you know brought forward in the past couple of years to have a whole program of study from week to week. So when we weren't, uh, you know, gathering together in a church building, we were we were holding church, right? We were, in our case, because of a widespread priesthood authority, we we're actually administering, you know, what we refer to as the sacrament at home, but just having those lessons and teaching, and I think it's just an, an area um, where you, there, there's a lot to, to, to learn and support each other and, and um, uh, help each other. Thank you. Awesome. So another question we had, we already touched on this a little bit, but we do have some of our panelists with some international experience. So this question was proposed, what national and international conditions suggest the need for more dialogue between Catholics and Latter-day Saints? I suppose oh, oh. Uh, let's go. Father or Monsignor Rodano, we'll hear from you first, and then we'll pass it on. I think I think some of the national and international conditions are areas where we've already had good contacts. I mean, mm -hmm. for example, I think in your paper, Ellen, it was maybe your paper where it spoke it speaks of the the contacts between. Um, uh, the Catholic Relief Services and uh, uh, groups of the Latter-day Saints working side by side in in places where there's poverty and and where people are experiencing great uh, suffering uh, because they're poor, where there's danger of terrorism, where there's danger of war. I, I think in from what I, in the little I know about our contacts, we, those areas um, can be places that can be even enhanced even further. That we've, uh, I think in your paper, you speak of 43 different countries where 
where um, uh, Catholic Relief Services and Latter-day Saints are working side by side. Um, and I think that's, that's, a, that's a place that, that uh, suggests the need for even more relations where, where we can both help each other. There are some issues which seem uh, impossible, maybe not impossible. I mean, for example, some interpret uh, understands your baptism. Maybe we, maybe we, we can't find ways of uh, solving the, the difficulties between us, but in terms of dealing with poverty and dealing with dangers of war that people are experiencing there, I think we can do, we've already done a lot and can do more. Thank you. Brother Paparazzi. Yeah, so uh, my primary responsibility um, as a professor in our department, uh, as you mentioned earlier, is to teach those courses that you know, are variously called comparative religions or war religions and specifically on, on Christianity. So really kind of what I'm in the business really of, of doing is trying to, to show uh, Latter-day Saints the, the goodness of different religious traditions and to learn from them. And, and uh, I do have a, a bias for Catholicism in that, in that I, I tend to do that uh, uh, more uh, than maybe I do with other traditions. Specifically, in my Christianity class, there seems to be this uh, default position of, of students that come into the class, kind of assuming that we have, as Latter day Saints, a deeper connection with Protestants uh, than we do with Catholics, and then we're much closer to them. And it's uh, it's a, a clear agenda of mine to show them uh, uh, that it's not the case. Uh, I want to highlight that uh, um, connection with Catholicism. But so one of the things that uh, that I talk about in my classes is um, the whole issue of enculturation um, of religion as a, a faith as it goes into different uh, cultures. And and this is a big question that uh, the the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints has to deal with in the 21st century as it becomes more and more international. So the question of what is um, non-negotiable standard uh, that has to be applied equally in every context, in every country, in every culture, and what, on the other hand, is uh, culturally adjustable. Um, and I, I don't know that we have all the answers for that. I think in many ways we're figuring it out uh, as we go, uh, coming from what we call the international church, um, um, you know, being a, a European literary saint. I've, I've been in contexts where several, um, uh, I've heard you know, complaints of fellow members uh, about how the church is too American, you know, and there's so many uh, American ways of doing things. And, uh, um, and so uh, I, I learned from my exposure to uh, also international forms of Catholicism, this whole issue of enculturation. I spent a couple of weeks in Japan and uh, I spent a week um, in, a, in a Catholic center. Actually, the, the, the nun who was one of the residents there, she was uh, my teacher on, the, uh, on Buddhism at, at the Gregorian University in Rome. <laughs> so that's how we made that connection. Um, and uh, it, it was just fascinating to see the way the mass was uh, performed in a Japanese context. And so, I mean, I'm just giving you a, an example here mm -hmm. of uh, how um, you can learn from the experience. And, and one of the things that I say often to my students is um, um, th there's something to say about having been around for 2000 years, right? I mean, there's an there's a historical experience there that can teach you a lot. And, and in many ways, uh, uh, you can look at, um, at our LDS tradition as being uh, in young adulthood, right? And so there's a lot of um, uh, enthusiasm and greatness that comes from that. But in talking to somebody who's more elderly, you can also learn a lot, you know, to make this kind of analogy. Uh, so that's just an example that I wanted to provide about that. I had some <clears throat> conversations along those lines with uh, Latter-day Saint friends. And uh, one of the things that comes up is um, how much uniformity do you have? 
And um, I said, we've been struggling with that ourselves, but the, 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 it's a, two things. If you let go of some of the control from the center, you don't know what's gonna pop up around the margins. On the other hand, if you don't do that, uh, you can restrict yourself to being like, in this case you mentioned, an American church. And um, how do you maintain unity within a, a, a church or a religion and at the same time allow for cultural uh, differences? I think that's a challenge. I think it's one we've been working on for centuries, but I think um, your example of Japan was a good one. Um, I remember talking one time uh, with a, a person, I think it was a Protestant, and he had been down in Central America and he was talking about how uh, he admired some It's because um, we're so big. I said, when we're being really bad in one part of the world, things are good in another part. Or when we're really bad in this century, a couple centuries later, we'll be on the good side. And so that, that sort of the age thing has its pluses and minuses. Um, and I think uh, that's, a, that's a challenge. And sometimes I watch from the sidelines, you know, and I listen to Latter-day Saints talking about what's it called correlation, I guess. Uh, and I, I said, okay, I can see where they're coming from. Uh, if Salt Lake City has to prove which picture of Jesus you have in your chapel uh, versus uh, like if I'm in Africa, I just local artists that commission that person. So it's, um, it's a little thing like that, but, uh, but it's like, I think this is um, the nature of religious experience it, once you become um, worldwide is that this, this becomes a challenge. Um, I remember a course I took on missiology where they said, you know, in our liturgy, we talk about Jesus being the lamb of God. And somebody said, well, what if you're in a culture where they don't know what a lamb is? Could we say the pig of God, which sounded horrifying to me, but it's, they said, but that would make sense in their culture. And those sorts of things, uh, you know, I never really thought of growing up in the Western world uh, that, um, you know, there's all sorts of cultural uh, underpinnings and, as, as you know, growing up in Italy, um, there's a difference between Italian Catholics and Irish Catholics. <laughs> and growing up Irish Catholic, you know, there's certain things people say, why do Catholics do that? And I'll say, I don't do that. I said, oh, I said, that's Italian Catholics. They do that, it's little things usually. But there are these cultural things that are part of people's faith experience. And talking to Latter-day Saints, some of them say from Massachusetts will say, these Utah people are different. You know, there's a, a regional, um, difference that, that takes place. I think so within each religion, there's a lot of variety. Thank you. All right, would anyone else like to respond to that while we're on this topic? I'd just like to say that I think there's a lot of specificity in both traditions about social justice issues that have yet to be explored. I mean, we can I think all identify particular issues that um, Latter-day Saints and Catholics can cooperate on, such as the position of the family and so forth. But I found in reading Mormon scripture, uh, particularly King Benjamin's sermon uh, in the Book of Mosiah, uh, a really powerful sense of social justice that Catholics can learn from and, and profitably engage. And so I think in one sense, dialogue is giving witness to something that's really important in America right now, which is uh, uh, pushing back against this divisive social and religious context that we have. But I would also make a case that um, there's a lot of what the LDS tradition talks about in terms of social justice that moves beyond simple political action that Catholics can benefit uh, greatly from. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think too on on um, on both churches, we um, live in an increasingly secular world, and um, I, I'm teaching at a Catholic school, and I noticed that oftentimes when matters are being discussed, the people of faith, whatever that faith is, speak a language that makes more sense to us than the people who are um, more secular. Uh, we, we don't agree on dogma or even on morals and things like that, but there's a certain um, believers, I think, have a certain um, commonality that the people who are coming from outside maybe are more um, atheistic or at least just totally secular. 
have a hard time, um, there's a harder time to bridge the gap or harder to bridge the gap, I think. I can, I sub people and they say, why do you go to the Mormon history? I say, well, I feel like an inside outsider because I can, I, I can step back because it's not my church. But on the other hand, I can feel um, an empathy with people because I, I can see the similar struggles that go on in both churches over things. So. I want to go back to that point about social justice just for a moment, because that's something that has been on my heart recently. Um, there is a talk that was given by one of my religious leaders. His name is Elder Holland. Um, and the talk is called, Are, Are We Not All Beggars? Um, and this talk is one of my favorites because it focuses so much on how we have this scriptural imperative um, from King Benjamin's speech, but also from the New Testament. Uh, to give to the poor and how that should be one of the foremost activities that we engage in. And I think of Matthew 25, which, you know, is a scripture that we as Latter-day Saints and Catholics share, where Christ highlights that one of the things that determines whether or not he will put us in heaven is whether or not we give to the poor. And one of the ways that I find uh, that can be effective for creating unity in a time that is really divisive in the United States is unifying over giving to the poor and in service with uh, fellow Catholics, Protestants, whatever religion people are, but especially uh, Catholics, because I have had a really great admiration for the Catholic social justice tradition that I think is really robust. And I know so many Catholics who avoid uh, political polarization, um, and they don't, you know, go don't go down the route of, um, you know, the the populism in a way that removes them from uh, the messages of Christianity. They they retain uh, the messages of Christianity with their political positions, and that's something that has really been admirable for me to see. Um, and I think that's something that, as Latter Day Saints and Catholics, we can uh, link arms in trying to relieve poverty and to carry people's burdens, uh, especially in a, in a day and age where I think we see them so much so much more frequently because we have social media. So we become more attuned to the suffering of the world. I, I, when you refer to Matthew 25, I do think that's appropriate for a context like this, when you talk about Christ and how he was dividing the sheep from the goats, so to speak. And you're right, the criteria that, that he mentioned were, were ones that everyone on this panel and everyone listening uh, can share in, um, you know, regardless of their, their, their faith tradition. Thank you. So moving on to our next question, um, Brother Shivers touched on this briefly. Both traditions have multiple sacraments and ordinances that we um, take part in beyond just baptism and communion. In your opinion, what does this suggest about God's grace and presence through your faith smoke, uh, movement, do sacramental experiences equate greater awareness of God's movement? I found this an interesting question. Um, I'm not sure if I'd be willing to place a value judgment of whether or not sacraments equate to greater awareness from God, but something that I have really hung on to is there's a 1978 statement from the first presidency of my church where they talk about how god has given a measure of light to all people that god gives light that leads people to truth and i have found that in uh my my experience in catholic sacraments as a catholic but also witnessing them um as a non-catholic now as a latter-day saint i've seen that i think that god's grace is very much present in those sacraments as well as in the ordinances of my faith too and i see that God often uses these things to lift people to Christ, that if someone has good intentions and if, if someone is trying to glorify Jesus Christ, I, I believe that my faith allows me to have a holy envy for what for what they do, but also see that God has an awareness of all people. Um, and, and that 1978 statement is, is my favorite first presidency statement in the history of first presidency statements, because it specifically highlights how no matter what tradition someone is from, God works in that tradition. And that's something that I, I love to be able to acknowledge and recognize in my own faith.
I would say that uh, you know the the, the sacramental uh, parallel is both an opportunity and a danger for both traditions, um, in the sense that uh, um, I believe we 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 both uh, recognize, and you can uh, those of you who are Catholic, you, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, the the necessity of the response uh, in the in the sacramental experience, and so. Uh, the fact that this is not just a, a magical uh, ritual that will inherently transform you no matter what your response is, um, but there needs to be um, the, the kind of welcoming and, and the kind of approach to it that can make it uh, an experience of um, invisible grace, right? So um, the, the danger that I see, um, you know, both in, in my tradition as a Latter-day Saint, as well as uh, uh, family members who are Catholic uh, that I've known growing up in Italy, is you, you go through these um, sacraments or ordinances, as Latter-day Saints call them, and kind of uh, think of them as a sort of checklist. You know, I mean, I've done this, I've done that. Um, uh, I'm kind of taken care of, as opposed to um, really looking them as steps of sanctification and justification in your process of growing closer to uh, to God. Um, so um, I think they are uh, something that we have in common, even though we may use different names and sometimes we uh, you know, Eucharist or the sacrament, and uh, we need to be careful with terminology, you know, because sometimes we may not understand each other. Um, but I think they are uh, a way to keep us on this path of discipleship uh, that is an advantage over uh, churches that are not as uh, sacramental in the same way. I, I think for myself, sacraments are central probably to my identity as a Catholic. And, um, but I agree with what was just said. Um, in our tradition, of course, we baptize infants. And in the last month, I had the occasion to baptize maybe four babies, maybe five. And um, I, I remember saying that, um, talking about the awesomeness of baptism and what it means, but pointing out that if, if there's no faith involved, if uh, in this case, the child is not going to be raised in the faith, and it's just a... Um, family thing or whatever, um, it's just superstition. It's just pouring water. And I think, um, that, you know, there have been debates about the efficacy of sacraments. Does it rely on the faith of the person, etc.? But I do think that there is a danger that um, ordinances or sacraments can be rote things that people um, um, don't give as much thought to, perhaps, as one would hope. But I do think they can be the, the, the source of great graces if um, if people enter into them um, and uh, with a realization of what they mean. Somebody recently, uh, we had a community meeting and they were talking about prayer. And one of the things he said is, uh, the most important thing about prayer is, does it transform you? And I think the same can be said of sacraments and ordinances. Do they transform your lives, your life? Um, and I, I think that um, probably my life has been transformed in ways I don't even recognize sometimes because I think there's a grace in the sacraments. But I do think, and uh, what struck me as a Catholic looking at the Latter-day Saints, I suddenly realized, gee, they have a lot of ordinances that parallel what we do. And I think that was because there are certain religious needs that all humans have that maybe weren't being met in Calvinist 19th century America. And, um, and, and so... Um, we've come to, in some ways to the same place, even though we're very different in our theology of what's going on, perhaps. I, 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 think, I think there is an analogy. I mean, if, if you look at the seven sacraments, there's, there, there is an analogy. But I, I also would just like to say, I know in our own faith, there has been a focus in recent years on, on what we refer to as the sacrament, but maybe the most, the, the Eucharist is, is is the analogy or, or, or term uh, as a parallel, but but for us, the focus that there's been on not taking that weekly ordinance for granted, and and really preparing for it and being ready for it, and having that be a spiritual 
high point in, in your week and part of your Sabbath observance and, you know, to lead you through the week and to find meaning in that, um, I think has been really I- important in our faith and just and not, you know, going sort of, it's a, it's a little bit going back to basics, but not just listening to the words, but internalizing them and, and listening to those promises. And, you know, in, in our case, the promise that of, of, keeping the commandments witnessing and having, you know, the Holy spirit be our, 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 our constant companion. Um, and that, you know, that's a marvelous blessing and, and to, you know, those words are, and, and those promises are powerful. And I, I think that that emphasis has been very, it's been important to me at least in just in my own practice. And I think it's been important to the church to have that emphasized. Monsignor, you're muted. The microphone icon should be, there you go, awesome. Okay. As I mentioned at the beginning, I one of the things that I, one of the reasons I accepted to come on this program is that I wanted to learn more about the uh, Latter-day Saints. So when we have the comparison of sacraments and ordinances. Um, how many ordinances would would the uh, Latter Day Saints identify? Does it compare with our seven sacraments? Are there seven ordinances? Or, if I may ask that question, just yeah, they're doing the same thing. I am and counting on her fingers. <laughs> I don't know. We don't use it by number, but if you were to look at, you know, baptism, we have baptism. Your confirmation, we have, we have confirmation. You have the Eucharist. We have a weekly, what we would call a sacrament. You have, you know, the 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 the, the anointing for us. You know, again, we don't. We would call the priesthood blessing, where someone could be anointed for health. Uh, when usually it's an, there's an anointing with with the oil followed by a, a priesthood blessing. Uh, you have the 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 ministry we have you know, the, the, the priesthood, uh, in, in our case, the, the priesthood is widely dispersed. We have 11 year old deacons, right. In, 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 in the, 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 the church. And we have, you know, it's a lay clergy where, uh, every male worthy male member can be ordained to a priesthood office. Um, so there's, you know, with the orders, there's equivalent. And, and then for us, the crowning, the, the, the crowning or we have temple ordinances that don't necessarily line up, but one of those temple ordinances is, is, is marriage, you know, internal marriage. And that's the crowning ordinance where we believe, you know, those keys, those priesthood keys, the bind on earth and bind on heaven are, you know, it's, it's, that's taking that marriage and binding a marriage in not only in earth, but in heaven. And so that's, that's for us a, a crowning ordinance where we believe, you know, marriage survives, survives death, you know, that it's with, with those same priesthood keys and that sealing power, it, it that ordinance is performed and it, it, it's, it has legitimacy here on the earth and in God's eternal kingdom. So that's, you know, there are some equivalents and obviously differences. Thank you. I, if someone else thinks I got that wrong or, or please. Uh, <laughs> I think one, also, one of the, uh, in a one of the uh, sacraments that we don't have as an ordinance is penance. Mm. So, uh, I mean, th- that can happen uh, for particular kinds of sins, uh, but it's not viewed as a as an ordinance. Mm. Mm-hmm. One of the things that I, I was struck by talking to an LDS friend about um, that, however, was the idea in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints that you can be rebaptized. Uh, that if you you do something awful or bad or you're excommunicated, you get rebaptized. But we would never rebaptize anybody. And I was thinking about talking to one of my fellow uh, friars here, and he said, "Oh, that's like in the early church when um, they would call uh, penance the second baptism, because they had a dilemma. What do you do? The, the idea was, well, once you're baptized, you'll never sin again. And then they certainly realized very quickly that that's not the case." So how do you deal with people who sin after? And I think for serious sins, for Catholics, you would go to confession. And for Latter-day Saints, you might get rebaptized. 
And somebody asked me, one of my God day saints, well, what if somebody wants to be rebaptized? And I said, it just isn't a thing with us. I mean, I've never had anybody say, I want to get rebaptized. Well, wouldn't they want to do it for devotional purposes? And I said, no. And then I got thinking, well, the reason is, I think they use the sacrament of penance in the way that Latter day Saints might use rebaptism. One other interesting thing that I think is worth mentioning is we also believe that we can do vicarious ordinances for our dead. Um, so we believe that we can have our ancestors be baptized um, and we stand in for them. Um, and that's the same with our uh, washing and anointing ordinances, as well as our endowment, um, which we believe is, is endowing us with priesthood power, both men and women receiving priesthood power in that instance, as well as vicarious sealings, not just marriage of, 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 of a couple, but also sealings of children to various couples. And I find that to be an interesting difference, too, where we believe that our, our ordinances can also be done for people that have gone before us. And that's something that um, Latter-day Saints have a massive focus on doing. Um, we, we constantly are building new temples and we're constantly trying to do our genealogy so that we can come to know our ancestors better. Um, so I find that to be a really interesting difference too, because coming from a Catholic perspective, when I heard that there were baptisms for the dead, that was really shocking to me because I was wondering how could you possibly do that? Um, and I think that that, that can kind of, uh, you know, set off a, a, some sore sub thoughts for some people, but it's still an interesting difference. Um, with the way that we believe our ordinances, or the scope of our ordinances, um, and, and how they how they work. One, one of our uh, one of my uh, Latter Day Saint friends and I were talking about um, our two spiritualities, and I said, you know, I think there, that's one thing, and partly we do have in common that Catholics have a concern for the dead. We're known for praying for the dead, uh, maybe asking our ancestors to help us. Or, and I was saying, I think for us, sometimes the sacrament takes that role. Uh, and I gave the example, when I receive the Eucharist on Sunday, I'm receiving the whole body of Christ, which includes my father who passed away 30 something years ago. It includes everybody who's been baptized from the beginning of time and into the future and in all parts of the world. So it's a unifying thing. In a way, I think that the, the ordinances of, of baptism for the dead are doing something uh, not exactly the same, there is this connection across the generations, I think, that, that takes place. But if you have that position of, um, let's say, rebaptizing someone who is dead, uh, could that person not be in heaven? And uh, why would they? Why would they need? If they are, why would they need to be baptized again? Well, so we believe that people go to what is called the spirit world um, after they die. And we believe that the ordinances that we perform vicariously for them are something that they can either choose to accept or deny. So they can say, no, I don't really want that baptism. Um, but we, we believe in a uh, universalist, uh, sorry, universalist approach to salvation. Um, so we have we believe that there are three kingdoms where people go to. Um, but they're all degrees of glory and that they're uh, all, you know, forms of salvation. Um, but there is still agency to choose to accept or deny ordinances. But we we don't believe that when people die, they immediately go to heaven. We believe that there's the spirit world. And then a thousand years after that of us doing more temple work and then um, final judgment. Yeah, the presence of uh, the ordinances for the dead does not imply uh, sort of uh, judgment on these individuals, uh, like uh, anticipating a negative judgment from, from God, and therefore they are in need of being redeemed by what we're doing. Uh, I, I, I like to see it from the perspective of, of the person who is serving in the temple, who is performing these ordinances as an act of service, as an act of uh, um uh, linking different generations, and uh, uh, I, I think that the connection with uh, the coming together at, uh, at the mass of uh, uh, all the saints in heaven and uh, on earth, and uh, creating this sort of uh, cosmic community of the followers of Christ, uh, there's a lot to say about the temple doing that. Uh, 
think there's a hand raised from the audience, actually. Yeah, awesome. So I'm going to unmute her so she can go ahead and ask that. Awesome, Anne, if you want to go ahead and ask. Uh, I believe you're muted. Thank you. Thank you very much for this discussion. And although I joined late, I wanted to ask you as a former high school teacher, I wondered if uh, someone could speak to uh, the emphasis that Latter-day Saints have on outreach to uh, youngsters, uh, particularly uh, teenagers. If you could talk about the emphasis, because I think it's definitely there. I think it's very admirable. And um, if you could just speak about that. I'm, I'm happy to say something, but I'm happy to defer to others as, as well. I mean, one, one of the things that I think has been very vital and, and one of the most important programs we've had is what we've referred to as a seminary where, where high school teenagers will gather either during the day or in, in, the, in my part of, the, part of the world, it's very early in the morning before school on a daily basis to study the scriptures and, and, and learn. And um, that, that I think in terms of transmitting faith from one generation to another and actually teaching is, has been extremely valuable. Um, you know, my, my, my wife taught uh, what we call seminary for, you know, five, six years on an early morning basis in, in, the, in the basement of our home. And, um, you know, apart from, you know, and, you know, neighbors having their yards driven over a few times by young teenage drivers, it was, uh, it was, it was a great experience for, uh, for all, for all involved. Um, but, but, you know, and that, that, that sacrifice of getting up early in the morning uh, and being devoted to something like that is, you know, really is rewarding. I've actually, oh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> I was going to say, from a Catholic point of view, when I told people I was going to participate in this, one of the things they said they really admire about the Latter-day Saints is uh, the missionary program, that you have young people who are paying their own way and are going on missions, and it keeps them involved at that, that age in their life. Um, and of course, that would also be true of you know, people becoming deacons at a very young age and and uh, uh, Relief Society and that sort of thing uh, later in different things for young women. Uh, but I think um, that would be um, something that um, I think often you, not often, but sometimes you hear people say, we should copy the, the Latter-day Saints on that regard. I had wondered whether you had ever heard of a, an organization. It, it was a while ago that I saw that they were called the Why Nots. Have you ever heard of that? They would go on and put on plays um, I saw a play in, uh, that was put on by the Latter-day Saints in Hawaii, and it made such an incredible impression on me uh, because it was just a, a play for teenagers. It was excellent. Uh, the messages were excellent. And uh, I wondered whether it still exists. Doesn't ring any bells. I, not for me. I haven't heard of it, um, but I was going to say that we have what are called young men and young women's programs where our our younger people get together uh, both on on Sundays but also midweek and they do various activities and I've I've definitely heard of a lot of young men and young women's groups doing plays or uh, doing music performances and that's been one thing that I, I also find really admirable too is um there's a lot of uh, youth stimulation there um, and I, we have what is called mutual, where uh, the young men and the young women, and these are ages 12 to 18 typically, um, and they get together once every single night together, sorry, not once every night, once a week together, and they have activities together. Um, and often things like plays will happen from that, but I haven't heard of that particular organization. Thank you so much. I appreciate it because I feel that they're the future and uh, I feel very strongly. Thank you so much. Thank you. 
May I just uh, go back and I think clear up what might be a misunderstanding. When I was speaking, when we were talking about what happens uh, after people die, um, I mentioned what is, what if a person is going to heaven, but we certainly, that could happen, but we also believe that a person could go to, to, to purgatory to be uh, renewed because of, of sins. And so we believe in that part of it, it's not just that everyone goes to heaven. We, we wouldn't uh, necessarily say that. Just wanted to clarify that. Yeah, and I think our, our spirit world, as Hannah spoke on, is kind of similar to purgatory in that way. I think that's a good, a good link to connect those two. I had a kind of humorous thing happen. A friend of mine left the Latter-day Saint Church with all of his family except for one son. And he said, Father Dan, I don't know what to do. I'm not going to be able to perform the ordinances for you. He said, but that's all right. I've asked my son to do it. And I said, oh, don't worry. I have a Latter-day Saint cousin. I'm sure he'll take care of it. <laughs> Great. Would anyone else like to speak on the talk of, uh, topic of ordinances? Or I'll move on to another question. Okay. Awesome. So we kind of talked about this in admiring the, the teachings of um, the involvement of the young people in the church, but what doctrine or practices do Latter-day Saints admire about Catholicism and vice versa? I'm happy to say something uh, about that. Um, First thing that comes to mind is the liturgical calendar. Um, and uh, even more specifically, uh, Holy Week. I think that as Latter-day Saints, we, we do Christmas pretty well, but not as well when it comes to Easter. And uh, I, I love all the, um, you know, the, the different services and the specific connections with that last week of uh, the Savior's ministry on uh, um, on Thursday with the washing of the feet, on uh, Good Friday, the Via Crucis, uh, uh, they have become a part of my personal way of uh, celebrating Holy Week. Um, it's one of those areas where I feel uh, deep holy envy for Catholicism. I, I'd be willing to echo that one. I, I wasn't going to share the experience originally, but my first Catholic Latter-day Saint dialogue occurred 50 years ago with with my you know best friend uh, who came from a Catholic family. We lived a block away. We were sort of in two different worlds. He went to St. Mary's and I went to Washington Elementary, and and he had his Catholic friends and I had my secular friends. And there was a, if it was a Venn diagram, there's that small intersection where we were, we were good friends. Um, but I, I remember learn, seeing, and in fact, with some, some envy, in, which I now appreciate, uh, where, you know, Easter was me getting sick on candy. And for him, it was like you know, Christmas all over again, uh, where how, how seriously that holiday was taken. And I do uh, appreciate uh, more and more um, what, uh, what, that, what that means. I, 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 you know, I also remember remember uh, going to his birthday party, and when they're going to say the prayer, I, as I've been taught, I closed my eyes and folded my arms, ready for someone to say the prayer. And I quickly learned there was a group participation exercise going on that I was missing out on, as everyone, you know, recited the the the, the, the prayer together, and and, and which. Um, you know, see, seeing that, but having some of those those experiences, I do do appreciate that as I, as I look back on it. For me, I really appreciate uh, the LDS sense of community. Um, I was having lunch at BYU. This was uh, some years ago, and everyone, you know, emphasized my uh, LDS colleagues emphasized. Um, the unity of the community. And I, I understand that any kind of social grouping is complex and, um, you know, talking about unity and so forth can often 
delve into caricatures about Mormons being pre-programmed or, or things like that. But I think what all of you have touched upon are these very, very powerful communal experiences that Latter-day Saints have. And for me, um, you know, I find Catholic life increasingly fractured along political lines. And that sense of community that I remember from my childhood is in some ways, um, if not lost, uh, certainly has a different character. Um, and secondly, I do believe that the LDS tradition makes very interesting theological claims, uh, claims about, um, you know, if you really want to look philosophically at it, claims about materiality in relation to spirit or spirit as materiality that I find very interesting to investigate. So I don't only really have a holy envy in terms of um, the communal experiences that uh, Latter-day Saints have, but also, too, what is, I think, a, a building and very, very interesting intellectual tradition um, that uh, will move in interesting directions. I really like the liturgical calendar, as has been mentioned, but also something that I have thought a lot about is the intellectual tradition of Catholicism. I find <clears throat> that to be really admirable um, and very powerful, as well as the sacrament of penance. That has been one that has stood out to me. Um, I remember when I when I first was able to do that um, when I was young, it was a really powerful experience for me. And I, I felt really changed when that happened. Um, I felt clean. It felt it felt really powerful for me. Um, and looking back on it, I, I think that that's a really beautiful way to commune with God. And it, it, it to me shows how Christ is a mediator. And that's something that I have holy and before, as well as the real presence. I think that that is such a, a powerful teaching and that would really, uh, I think, command a lot of respect for the Eucharist and a lot of respect for what goes on um, during a mass and, and just how literal the symbolism is and how real it is. That's been something that has really, really caused me to just pause and admire the beauty and the truth and the power in Catholicism. Thank you. I'll, I'll add one more just uh, while we're at it. Um, uh, spirituality, uh, specifically uh, when it comes to the uh, contemplative tradition. Uh, that's one thing that uh, in, in some ways I have uh, experienced firsthand. I've, I've taken the opportunity of uh, doing a spiritual retreat at a Jesuit center on a couple of different occasions. Um, and just the, the well, first of all, the, the openness and the welcoming to people of all different traditions. And then, uh, you know, the focus on just um, uh, slowing down and um, wanting to to listen to, to God's word to you and uh, um, that's that's something that we, it, as Latter-day Saints, we have it as a principle, but we don't have it structured in the same way where uh, you can go and spend a week uh, in a in a place and uh, and focus on just uh, meeting with a uh, spiritual director and uh, and and read your scriptures and pray. So um, that whole history and that great diversity of spiritualities with all their different charisms and, and strengths is something that I have a great admiration for. Thank you. All right, we have about 15 minutes left. If anyone else would like to speak on this topic, let me know or else we'll go on to our last question. Okay, awesome. So our final question um, is kind of to look to the future. And what are some important topics we should continue dialoguing about in order to build and continue relationships? I, I think maybe there's a, uh, a difference between what uh, anybody could do versus what trained theologians might do. I think for theologians, it might be important to continue studying patristics, uh, to study doctrine um, uh, from both 
denominations and um, uh, maybe to have more organized, um, um, like uh, Monsignor mentioned before, there's these uh, official dialogues with different faiths and different Christian groups. Uh, that uh, A friend of mine, for example, is part of the Reformed Catholic Dialogue. Maybe there's something more formal like that on the theological front. But I think there's also ways in which maybe we could uh, come together um, even to pray together, not in a, a strictly um, denominational format, but in um, just as, as common um, believers and common followers of Christ. Uh, so I think maybe looking into to some sort of programming along that line that would bring together the average people who might not be comfortable talking about, um, you know, um, deep uh, discussions of incarnation or Trinity or something like that, but who would be very willing to um, come together to talk about their own spiritual lives and um, and maybe how we can help each other with those. Um, I just like the beautiful thing was just said about going um, to, even though it was Jesuit, you know, Jesuit spirituality, being a Francis. Yeah. It's okay, I was ordained by a Jesuit bishop. Uh, but one of my uh, Latter-day Saint friends said, uh, what can you tell us that would help us to have more reverence during the sacrament. Um, he, he thought he found a certain reverence in Catholicism. And we talked about different ideas. So I think there are things on that level that anybody can participate in and uh, just to bring people together with their neighbors. Uh, now, depends where you live. You may have more or fewer Catholics or Latter-day Saints, but uh, I've been told I'm a Latter-day Saint magnet. Wherever I go, I seem to attract the elders. And I always pretend I don't know what they're talking about at first. And then I say, oh, well, what about the three Nephites? <laughs> so one thing that I've been thinking about is just the general decline of religiosity in the United States of America. I've, I've looked a lot into what Pew Research has done about uh, tracking trends over the last 10 years and seeing the decline of you know, pretty much every Christian faith in terms of practice within the United States, even though the growth rates might be different internationally. And they, I know they certainly are for Latter-day Saints. I'm not sure what they're like for, for Catholics at this time. Um, but one of the things that I think is really important was what was said at the beginning, which is finding unity as brothers and sisters in Christ and trying to find those common things that we can do together, the ways that we can serve God and serve our neighbor together um, to break down those divisions and to break down that polarization. I think the the political polarization in the United States also contributes to this too, where we're feeling increasingly at odds with each other. And I think the the best way to break through those barriers um, is not only to dialogue to try to understand each other, which is incredibly important, but also to serve God with one another and to find ways that we can lead others to Jesus Christ and be ourselves brought to Jesus Christ too, not as separate denominations, but as a family of God. I can uh, continue on in that line. I think one of the um, most important topics that we should continue doing, uh, dialoguing, it says, or doing, I think is, I think I think we've been relatively successful, as I understand it, in collaborating on work for the poor. Uh, the Catholic Relief Services and uh, LDS groups working together. As I saw on one account, uh, in 43 different countries where they've assisted each other, they've worked together, and I, I think that's. That's a that's a major con concern, a, a major need, and I think if they've found success in doing that, that would be a good place to continue, continue to do that, and uh, um, and and support each other in doing that. I think that would be important. Great. I think for me too, and I like to echo what. Monsignor said, and also what Hannah said um, about cooperative action. I think one thing about dialogue, or one thing that's necessary about dialogue, is an openness to grace or an openness to surprise. And that in some ways, um, when we start talking and start taking each other 
seriously as brothers and sisters in Christ, new possibilities will open for all of us. Because one of the things I find most attractive about dialogue is obviously uh, you know, getting to know um, different people of different faith traditions, but also how they reflect something back that's important or that I may have forgotten about my own faith tradition. So I, you know, I'm looking forward to more and uh, substantive opportunities for dialogue with uh, an openness that uh, we all might be surprised with what we say and what we learn. I, I would echo that in a certain way. I think that um, one of the things about dialogue, it helps you to know your own tradition better. And uh, we have a Muslim student association here and I was thanking the students. I said, because your presence and your faithfulness to your faith causes our students to say, well, what do I believe? Uh, how, how am I living compared to these people? And so I said, you provide a real service for us by being present to us. And I think all of us can do that um, by um, being faithful to our own tradition and yet open to um, the sharing. And I think the, the, the dialogue, you know, sometimes I'll be in a dialogue like this and then I'll go home and I'll say, oh, well, do we have anything like that? And what do we believe about that? And how, you know, and, and so it makes you stronger, I think in your own, uh, you might say in a, in a LDS terms, your own testimony, um, if you, um, engage with other people. And it's not to say against their testimony, but to say that, you know, I'm strengthened in my, my faith in the savior because I have had this opportunity to listen to people coming from a very different point, but also from a, our hearts are in the same place. Absolutely. And, you know, I would say that was my personal experience when I was studying at the Gregorian. Um, I felt as a result of that uh, experience that I became a better Christian, um, that um, I opened my, my mind and my heart to some uh, truths in Catholicism that I wasn't aware of. At the same time, I solidified uh, the, my own testimony and some truths that um, I had grown up with uh, as part of the Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints. And um, so, you know, there's a lot to say about uh, just exposure and interaction um, and, and that ability to, to pray together. I, I was really happy to see uh, at the end of the, a couple of the last uh, BYU football games, uh, the one against Baylor, uh, which is a Baptist university, uh, and then the one against Virginia, all the players at the end uh, met at the center of, uh, of the field and, and prayed together. Um, so here's a, you know, a, an LDS university and a Baptist university, uh, and they are praying together. So uh, that, that was a great uh, thing for me to witness. And I think um, it's something that can happen much more than it has. All right, um, we have about seven minutes left. I don't know if anyone wants to say anything else or have any final statements before we um, close. I would just like to say thank you for doing this, Ellen. I think you've provided a real opportunity for us and a real service uh, to everybody who's uh, been able to be on the panel, but also to uh, to listen in or to, to view this. So thank you. Thank you. And thank yes, you thank to, you. Mm -hmm. yes, thank you to all of you for coming because it wouldn't be possible without you, obviously. Thank um, you. Ellen, could I ask you a, a quick question? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> since, since you are finishing an experience as a Latter-day Saint in a, in a Catholic university, Mm -hmm. Would you like to share something about what your experience has been like? Yeah, um, a lot of people like ask me, they're like, oh, is it hard? Like, is it weird being a Latter-day Saint? And it's not hard. I don't think it's that weird. People do have reactions that I'm sure a lot of us in New Jersey or other states with lower Latter-day Saint populations get. Like, they're kind of taken aback. A lot of friends have been like, I've never met a Mormon before. Like, they think it's kind of weird. Um, but usually once you explain to people, they're very understanding and I haven't met with any resistance. And I've, you know, I've had a great time preparing this event and really seeing support 
from my my Catholic friends and Catholic colleagues here at Seton Hall. So. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So thank you all again. And Brother Shivers is going to close us with a um, closing prayer. All right. Thank you. Our kind Heavenly Father, we're very grateful for the chance we've had to to uh, enjoy this time together. We're grateful for the, the spirit we've uh, felt of being uplifted. We're grateful for our testimonies of thee and, and thy son, for uh, our, our savior, Jesus Christ, for his life uh, and for his teachings and for uh, the, his, his spirit that we have felt as we've spoken. We ask a blessing uh, upon those who have participated and listened and who view uh, these proceedings that will also uh, be uplifted. Please uh, bless uh, Ellen in her ongoing uh, work and, and, and studies as she uh, puts this to, to, together. We're um, thankful for uh, the the blessings that we enjoy of, of freedom to have these discussions. We uh, pray for the leaders of the world. We pray for uh, those among us and in our, in our neighborhoods and communities that we can uh, seek in increased uh, unity and and uh, and a fear away from the uh, contention that we've been experiencing lately. And we uh, pray for these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you all again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.